everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this fourth Goddess Lounge, Calendar Girl Goddess. And we're delighted to host some brilliant women today. Two of them have got PhDs. Another one should have a PhD in ecology. And we're also so grateful to the Arts Council for funding this series of six Goddess Lounges. All the artists' fees are paid for. We do need to find a little bit more match funding, £200 a night. So if you do feel you can make a donation, Laura will put the PayPal link in the chat. So please, talking of the chat, do use it and enjoy yourselves and communicate with each other. It's really nice that we're all together as we're beginning to emerge and come out of lockdown. And our first goddess is Aphrodite, who is one of many world goddesses who instigate the beginning calendars. Can we look at her film, please, Laura? The birth of Aphrodite marks the world's first calendar. Mother Earth and Father Sky were making love, climaxing in ecstatic bursts of sunrise oh, and giving birth to fully formed gods, gods of plants, gods of trees, gods of this, gods of that, all subsisting in a primordial state of pure and changing bliss. And then one of the gods got jealous and decided they wanted to own everything. They made the world's first weapon and castrated their father right at the ecstatic burst of oh, sunrise and sent the phallus ding, 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 ejaculating into the ocean. Mother Earth screamed and split into continents. Father Sky howled and drifted apart as clouds. Leaves withered, fruit fell splat. The moon went black and the sun sank and the gods <laughs> fell asleep, only one thing moving, that sperm, ding, 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 of Father Sky, down, down, until it found the mother in the deep, and they gave birth to Aphrodite. Naked, fully formed, ready for anything, swan white pearls, around her breasts, earrings made from the volcanically hot sperm of Father Sky that crystallised in the cold of the ocean. And as she pushed up through the darkness, out of the membrane of the water, a crescent moon appeared and the ocean went wild because time was beginning. And as she surfed across the spray, dolphins arched her instep and little swallows. made her a chariot out of shells. And when she leapt onto the sand, the sun rose and snakes leapt into her hands and shed their skins for the first time. And as she walked up Mount Olympus, in her wake, plants, trees and humans sprang up. And at the top of that oh-so-famous mountain, she saw her first sleeping god, the god of fruit. Let's dance. Oh, yes, please. And as they danced, they crushed grapes and down Mount Olympus. Wine. And the human beings had a roller coaster of a time because, like little birds, they drank. And when Aphrodite saw them getting it together, she considered her work done and went on to the next god. The god of messages, communication, intercourse. <sighs> Could we converse? Oh, yes, let's chat. And as they conversed, they began traversing each other's minds bodies, souls, until the god of messages grew wings on his head, wings on his heels, and that wasn't the only part of his anatomy that grew wings. And on earth, the human beings got the hang of all this love business. And on went Aphrodite to the next god, the god of war. War! I want to own you! Ah, 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 ah. 
Try it. They fought. And on Earth, the hawk caught the first rabbit. Wars began. But Aphrodite will always win. Get off! I seem to have lost one of my crystal earrings. I need to renew my virginity, my purity, my wildness in the ocean. <sighs> and you, moon, with me. And as Aphrodite and the waning moon, split apart by war, went into the ocean, it was only one night of darkness that they needed. And Aphrodite totally reborn, was running in the forests. And then she heard a crying coming from a myrrh tree. It split as she looked at it and there was a little baby. Hair as black as midnight, lips as red as berries and Aphrodite got it. Oh! A small human, a new human like the new moon. I love him! Well, she loved him so much that he grew from a baby to a boy to a young man and she said, you are my lord, Adonis, my roebuck. My stag, my clustering vine, my mountain of wheat, my mouthful of wine. For the first time, I'm in love. And he said, you are my garden enclosed, my apple, my dove, my fountain concealed, my lily, my love. So sweet, so pure was their love that grains, fruits, vegetables for the human beings were in abundance. But the god of war up on Mount Olympus saw Aphrodite had fallen in love with a human being and was jealous. He wanted to own her. And so he took the shape of a boar with the tusks of a boar and came stampeding down Mount Olympus and gored the young man in the groin. Aphrodite, no, caught him just as the boar went stampeding on and her tears and his blood mingled and fell into the earth and she carried him to the ocean. And as she did, women, ordinary women, working mothers, holy prostitutes, walked behind, weeping, and carrying shallow gardens of lettuce and barley grown on shards of terracotta, gardens destined to bloom quickly and fade fast, just like Adonis. And they threw those gardens into the ocean after Aphrodite and then tore their skin in grief. But they needn't have worried because Aphrodite will always win. And next spring, where the tears and the blood had fallen, came anemone flowers, black in the centre like Adonis's hair, but the petals don't last very long because Aphrodite <sighs> blows them away to redden the sun for the people's harvest. You know, Aphrodite was here recently. Yes, yeah, she was upset because nobody was worshipping her anymore. I mean, do you take little shallow gardens and throw them into the ocean in memory of Aphrodite and Adonis? No. You stroke the hills and valleys as if they're her curvy bits? I'm guessing not. And so she incarnated here in Piccadilly Circus and saw what the problem was. She had been superseded by giantesses with names like the North Face. The only ray of hope was, of course, Eros. Eros is her beloved son. His paternity is in dispute. Some say he's the child of the god of messages or fruit. Sometimes he can be like a butterfly light, bright, sometimes lethal as a bee, but she had never seen him petrified in stone. This was the way things had got. And then she got an idea. It was quite clear to her that people were otherwise enchanted, otherwise they would have built her a water purification plant or a temple. But no, they walked along staring into space with their ears plugged or heads down texting on smartphones. She thought she'd try this texting malarkey but goddesses don't travel with Wi-Fi. And so she sent a heart text. Cupid, passion and fire needed. Come quickly, mum. And he began to pirouette off his pyramid and he landed straight down into Aphrodite's arms. And he started to do what he always does when he gets very excited. He began to roll his eyes like shiny olives and send out shards of light into the hearts of the passers-by. And they got it together, sitting on steps, up against the railings, in Leicester Square. Of course, they were bus 
arrested by police in riot shields, impervious to the arrows of Eros Cupid. They pinned him to the ground, handcuffed him, and said that he was in flagrant defiance of the rule of six. And because of that, if he couldn't pay the £10,000 fine, he would have to go to jail. Aphrodite was desperate. He was banged up, but she doesn't travel with filthy lucre. And then she got an idea. She found a scrap of paper and a pen. And deciding that the old ways were the best ways, she started to write. If you want me up against a wall, that's a lamb. If you want me to bend over, that's a shekel. But hey, honey man, don't go ploughing any other moist patch. I will be your moist patch. Don't go digging any other canal. I will be your canal. It seemed to work. And after 168 hours of sometimes back-breaking work, she'd made Thank enough to free much, Cupid. Guys. My name is Gina Marvel. Please follow me on YouTube and Instagram. Thank you very much. And she'd also increased in height because of all the new adoration, but still she was exhausted. Her wrinkles had disappeared, but she needed to get to the ocean because it was the waning moon. But there was nothing for it, the ocean was miles away, and so she and Cupid stretched along the length of Piccadilly and a cocoon grew around them. But the thing was, everybody who had felt one of those arrows of Cupid's hit their heart, they were so kick-started that they began to gather litter and recycle and scatter seeds on every patch of earth, scatter seeds in between the pavements, scatter climate data on every computer. And this new adoration meant that in their cocoon, Aphrodite and Eros began to liquefy, melt, plastic, bone, flesh, stone, began to dissolve until crack the chrysalis opened and out came thousands and thousands of butterflies. And from the cracks in the pavement, thousands and thousands of wild flowers buzzing. And everybody that felt the brush of a petal, a butterfly's wing or a bee, became an Aphrodite devotee. They busted it, trained it, hitched it, ran it all the way to the coast. And when they got to the ocean, they dived in. And as they dived in, they remembered that two-thirds of the world's wildlife species had disappeared in the last 50 years and they began to weep. And as they wept, they felt their virginity purified in the ocean. And when they came out, they began to research, fund, carry out multiple environmental and scientific endeavors. And if they succeed, if we succeed, we will find that pollution clears, emissions hit zero, sea levels stop rising, ice caps stop melting, our planet and all its calendars can continue. I'm always in awe, Laura, how you create so many exquisite images to go with the stories. And you do it all independently, don't you? Yes, I do. Well, it's it's an honour and a privilege to be part of this and be here for this. So I have a bit of a background in classics and literature. So I'm fascinated with myths and stories anyway. And to get the chance to work along you with to work alongside you and such incredible artists really is just a dream come true. So I do spend quite a lot of time on them. Well, we're hugely lucky. Can you just show us one transformation? where you take a painting and then apply it to the film. Yes, of course. So let me share this here. This is from about the 18th century. It's an elaborate wall decoration by Tommaso Bugatti. So one of the ways I work is it's like the way stories themselves are built. It's in layers, you know, when you're working with any kind of editorial software, that's how it's built and layers themselves and stories themselves are built over years in different retellings, one upon the other, sometimes bits getting rubbed out, sometimes bits getting changed or rearranged, but really what's at the heart of it kind of carries through. Um, and it's the same with editing. So you can see this and it's very beautiful, quite whimsical, much more romantic. Um, 
And then it's the scene, obviously, after Adonis has been gored. So here you can see the moment in uh, the film itself. And I've used an overlay of an ancient wall with this faded ancient Greek lettering on it. So that it already feels like a story that was once written and has slightly been changed and eroded by time layered up again if you will and you can sort of see the echoes of emotion you can see a lovely dog <laughs> um and you can yeah it, but it's still quite worlds away from what it was i like what you said about layering the images and how stories also are made up of layers and we repeat them through history if they've got good enough strong enough archetypal images and so we played around with time didn't we with our aphrodite you know we've got byzantine calendars and was it Byzantine the UN East? Yes, so the second one was Byzantine. The first one was Aztec, I believe, um, which I added in just to really, we wanted it to be Mayan, but we couldn't quite, it, one of the oldest ones is this um, sun calendar, this huge disc that's currently in a museum in Mexico. And that's how we started. Yeah, so the, the round is, I always think that sort of the round of the calendar is a little bit like the goddess's mouth because it's all happening at once. That they're, they're out of time. They're out of time, aren't they? Can we just look at one other image and what you've done with it. Yes, of course we can. So this is by Giovanni Martino de Boni, and this is again from about 1800. Yeah, and you've got, you've got the, all the characters, haven't you? You've got Aphrodite there with Adonis, but you've also got Cupid and dog. And of course, I, I love dogs. So can you show us where that came in the film, how you used it? Of course I can. So again, this is, you see the way it's faded. It's using the wall. I use the wall throughout um, because I like to create a consistent pattern. And I, I like to create the illusion that almost the story is being carved into the wall as it goes. So you can see that again, but it's playing with senses of scale and trying to create the emotion happening with you as the centre. So obviously Aphrodite is reaching up around you and the curve of everyone mourning is to the side of you, which I did with quite a few of them. I mean, I find that incredible because you've totally changed the textures, but I just want you to just, somebody noted in the chat that uh, you, they liked the ready breath effect. Um, and I remember when <laughs> you this, I said it was probably before your, your time, they used to have children eating ready breath and going out nice and warm into the day. Just tell us why you did that. Mine had a very, yeah, a very separate uh, inspiration, but so we, we'd done the recording with the green screen, obviously for the segment. And I didn't twig at all that the green seaweed in your wig was obviously green. And normally uh, for anyone who hasn't used a green screen, you have to make sure you're not wearing any green, otherwise that gets keyed out and removed with the background. Um, and it was sadly not enough of a different shade of green that I could really get around it. And we tried quite a few different things. I even tried um, mapping a green wig behind your head and just <laughs> manually doing it and I think I got maybe half an hour in before I realized that it was definitely about like Faustian hell to madness <laughs> sorry Faustian past to hell and madness you know and just was not the way um and then I remembered Disney's Hercules so <laughs> I remember you saying you haven't seen it all of the gods and goddesses on Mount Olympus have their own unique glow I believe Aphrodite's was actually pink and I did try blue and pink at first but it didn't really work across all the different uh like screens and realms I took you through. But obviously everyone knows God's glow gold, or at least they do now. So that was my inspiration. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And let's go to another goddess now. Let's go to Seema Anand. I believe there's one last goddess you've missed out. Oh, who's that? <laughs> oh yeah so that's Rue you know I'm crazy about dogs any excuse for an image of my dog and there's the long dog that you see in the pictures as well a very old breed but probably kind of like you know breeds whatever you call it layered and layered and bred and bred there she is that's Rue thanks Laura <laughs> so yes let's go to Seema Anand who is a mythologist and a storyteller Dr Seema Anand and who wrote the arts of seduction we've got the arts of seduction here and I'm just going to read a little bit for you. She, her, her, just her chapters are enough. The art of perfuming, love bites, erotic nerves, dildos, romance, seduction, and fulfillment. Can you not buy this book? Um, Seema, we had Cupid in the last story, and you've got a Cupid in Indian mythology, haven't you, called Khan Dave? 
Yes, you're absolutely correct. And he's called Kamdev um, with a slight difference. So he's very, very much like the Cupid character in uh, European mythology. The slight difference is that in the ancient Indian mythology, Q uh, Kamdev, uh, the god of love and desire, gets killed off very early in our mythology. Uh, Lord Shiva gets very annoyed with him and he opens up his third eye, incinerates him where he stands. And so Cupid is dead, Kamdev is dead. And, but what, what happens now is that Kamdev's wife, Rati, who's absolutely distraught at her husband's death, says that she can't live without him. She's gonna kill herself. But the other gods now come and say to her, you can't kill yourself because the world cannot exist without love and desire. So you need to carry his work on. And if you carry on his work, then at some stage later, we will bring him back to life for you. And so in, um, in our mythology, we believe that it is Rati who wrote most of the texts on love. And I think that's why the ancient Indian texts on love and desire are just so beautiful and so delicate and so refined because they were written by a woman. And I think that's why they're also so sort of woman orientated. Oh, as were the 30 Forgotten Love Festivals. Women. As were the 30 Forgotten Love Festivals. So interestingly, we are in the month of spring. And, well, I call it the month of spring because on the, in the Hindu calendar, this is the month of Chetra, which kind of goes uh, sort of from mid-April to mid-May, uh, mid approximately. And it sort of heralds the end of winter and the start of spring. And um, the, the great thing about, so, it, you know, when we talk about the 30 love festivals, the difference between the love festivals from, from ancient India are that this is not about Two people are, you know, like on Valentine's Day, you have two people trying, you know, or in a relationship or trying to be in a relationship, coming together, um, trying to be physically closer together, etc., celebrating their love. This is, these love festivals were about arousing Mother Earth to a sense of her own pleasure. So it was about getting Mother Earth to sort of let go of her sap and let that sap come flooding through and saturate her and every other living thing in nature saturated with that same sap of excitement and you know just let that pleasure light up everybody's life and pleasure let me reiterate is not sex it's not just sex pleasure comes in so many different ways and you know it's it sort of um it, it includes things like singing and dancing and laughter and music and games and company and all sorts of things. So the 30 festivals of love, the 30 love festivals of spring from ancient India include all of this. But I tell you the other thing that I really love about these is that, and I guess that's why we lost them in the first place because the Kama Sutra of 2000 years ago talks about the 30 festivals of love, but as we come forward, we don't even hear about most of them. They were not huge, big festivals and prayers performed by the Brahmins, by the priests, and um, you know, with lots of rituals and stuff. And I guess in the translation, the Brahmins probably thought, well, if we're not part of it and we're not gonna be given money for it, why bother with the translation? Because these festivals were performed by women and the rituals were performed by women. And they, it, they were all about laughter and happiness and going on picnics and having a drink with, with your friends and going on, you know, putting up swings in the garden and swinging to them. And they're just utterly, utterly beautiful. And each one is dedicated to bringing the bringing nature back to awareness and pleasure. It's not about the individual. Mm -hmm. But I love the fact that it's the women and it's their role to actually arouse Mother Earth. Uh, it's not the others. It's, it's they who will bring her back to her own pleasure. I mean, I can tell by the way you're talking about it that you are absolutely passionate about this subject, pleasure. Uh, isn't it one of the paths to heaven? Yes. Yeah, so, okay, now uh, this is something that we believed. Um, okay, so the Kama Sutra definitely says it's the path to heaven. But um, I guess it's better known when you talk about it in Tantra, because in Tantra, they definitely talk about this as one of the modalities. So there are different philosophies and there are different ways of, so when you talk about the path to heaven, you can call it different things. It's either about the attainment of the upper mind or the elevation of the mind or the healing of the soul whatever you want to call it. So there are different ways that we feel that you can get to that point. One is um, 
you get to heaven through grief. So you use that as your path. So it's basically about um, you, what you give up and who you give up and your sacrifice and, and so on. So that's one way of attaining God. The next one is through pain. So you have lots of cultures where you would beat, each, uh, beat yourself or um, deny yourself stuff, you know, whether it's food or whether it's water. And basically it's through denial and pain. And finally, of course, there is this idea of um, attaining heaven through pleasure. Pleasure being all the different things that light up your life. If you think that the, the we say that our, our shakti, you know, pleasure is a shakti, it's the energy, it's your life force. And if this pleasure sits right at the base of your spine and the muladhara chakra, and it's supposed to rise up from there. It basically has to light up every part of you as it comes out. You know, it, it saturates, it imbues you with, with pleasure, with, with happiness, with goodness as it goes through. And it's supposed to be the most powerful energy. And if you can harness that energy, you can harness the universe. Is that connected to the, the channels of love that you sometimes talk about? Or... Yes. So, you know, when we talk about this thing of uh, this idea of being the path to pleasure. So we always, in Tantra again, you know, there's a lot of um, sexual yogic positions. So there's a lot of practices that involve sexual yoga, sexual practices. And in this, generally, you have the man as the door and the woman becomes the vessel. So uh, she becomes the path for him to channel that pleasure to get to the elevated mind. Now, you very seldom will come across a set of practices where the woman becomes the doer and the man acts as the vessel for becoming that path to, to her pleasure. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess, again, you know, as with the love festivals, maybe it didn't suit the, the people who were translating. It was mostly the men, the Brahmins, who were translating the texts. And Maybe it just didn't suit them. It wasn't of great importance to them, so they didn't bother to translate the text. But all philosophy in ancient times was converted into stories to explain it better, because a story always explains something better than a philosophy does. And um, so the stories are there, and those stories creep through. And that's what's so amazing. And one of my favorite stories, so I haven't found the, the tantra which describes the different positions of how the woman would actually be the doer but I have a story for you if you'd like to hear it mm -hmm. and in this story basically it starts with this courtesan and a man who comes to visit her regularly and one time when he comes she smells the perfume of another woman on him and contrary to what most people think oh my god you know she's smelling the perfume of another woman on him and you know this is going to lead to an insecurity or a fight she starts to become absolutely fascinated by this other woman, because if you think again, the first chapter in that book of mine is about perfume. The idea of how you perfumed yourself was that every part of the body was fragranced with a different perfume and it had to be very distinctly different. And so at the end of it, you were like almost like a banquet of smells and tastes and textures. And now imagine that if every part of your body has a different fragrance, what is the perfume you're leaving on your lover? It depends on what you've been doing and for how long. And that, you know, what have you left on what part of him? And so she gets fascinated by what the other woman, she, she imagines the other woman to have done and it, just by the perfume that she smells on him. And um, she starts to leave messages for the other woman on this man's body in the way of love, in the way of love bites and love scratches. Because again, we are told that every love bite, every love scratch had its own vocabulary. It had its own occasion. It had its own message. I, it, you know, it, it's a very intense communication technique. So it's, she starts to leave messages on his body for the other woman. And eventually the other woman picks it up and she starts to respond. And the two of them have this most intense affair. They, they never meet, but they explore each other's bodies and they explore each other's pleasure through his body. So he becomes the channel for it. And I always think he's probably just lying there all scratched up, you know, thinking that he's got these two women who he's excited to so much pleasure. But in actual fact, these are two women who are, they're, they're making love to each other, but through him. They're angels. 
Yeah, it, the agency, you're absolutely right. And I've never come across a story like this. It's just so, it, you know, it, it opens up my mind. It opens up every single nerve ending. It makes me think so much more deeply. And you are actually in the process of uncovering more stories like that, aren't you? And we won't, you yes. won't get a story anywhere else. No, you won't get any of these stories anywhere else just because they're so difficult to find. Um, but yeah, I'm in the process of uncovering some of these stories and maybe we get to talk about some of them a little bit later. Yes, fantastic. Well, thank you for bringing them to the Goddess Lounge. Thanks, Seema. So, well, I think we'll go now to, <laughs> to Dr. Joanna Gillard. So we're absolutely delighted to have Joanna Gillard on the Goddess Lounge, who is the founder of Story Commons and is an eco storyteller. And she's going to tell us the um, beautifully refreshing story of the Celtic Kaliak. But there are lots of stories, Joanna. Why did you choose this one at this time of year? Thank you, Santhi. I'm feeling very exhilarated from your video and Seema's conversation now. So the Kaliak, yes, absolutely. So when people know of the Kaliak, they think mostly of her as the winter hag, the blue-skinned goddess with the single, uh, single red-rimmed eye. Um, and there's a story which probably crystallised in the 19th century, uh, where the Kaliak is the kind of the malevol malevolent hag of winter. And she locks away the goddess of spring she locks away breed and the only way that spring can return is that she, the Keliak has to be killed by Angus Og and um, the god of summer and sun and the, and the Keliak uh, then the spring can return and I was really interested to find that in some of the stories the Keliak and breed are considered to be the same and I, taught, I chose this story not just because it's a celebration of spring, but it's also a celebration of the fluid flow between youth and age, between the Kaliak and Breed, and it doesn't have that enmity, that jealousy between goddesses or between youth and age. Yes, a bit like the Goddess Lounge. We were talking earlier about the wonder of bingo wings. I know you haven't got them yet, Joanna, <laughs> but yeah, we're all celebrating whatever stage we are in the Goddess cycle. But yes, Laura, can you take it away and play Joanna's film? Thank you. They tell many stories of the Kaliak, ancient white-haired hag of winter with her blue skin and her single red-rimmed eye. Some say she is older than the flood itself. Some say she is a truth teller or trickster or crone goddess, guardian of the lands. The Kaliak was old. So old her bones were old. So old her eyes danced with the silence of a thousand winters and her muscles and sinews ached with the bones that she'd rolled across the high bright lands of the north releasing mountains, making locks. The Kaliak was old, but around her pulsed the new green pulse of the spring. She could feel it in her bones, in her dew drop white bones she could feel the blackthorn petals striking out against their branches. In her bones, in her marrow, her blood, her flesh and her blue bright skin, she could feel the brave anemones striking up through the soil. The Kaliak was old and she wore her age like a shawl of stillness. In March and April she was still, still as a gnarled tree branch, attendant upon the green dream of unfurling leaf. She was still as love songs sprung across the earth and still as the dancing began. And as the dancing spread out across the earth and the moon rounded the high bright April moon, the Kaliak knew that the world was ready and it was time for her to let go of that shore of old silence and become the dancer. I don't know if you know what must happen for the Kaliak to make her transformation. The shepherd knew, the shepherd with his cottage on the edge of Loch Bar. He didn't know why he knew. He didn't really know what to do with his knowledge for nobody else seemed to speak of it. But he knew that on the eve of Beltane, he must keep his dogs inside and bolt the door. For the Kaliak that night would make her change, 
and if a dog barked across the shores of Loch Bar too early, if the dog broke the silence, or if a wolf howled or a fox sung too early while she was still wrapped in her web of silence, then she would fall to a pile of bones and it would be all over for her. And so the shepherd that night locked and bolted the door and kept his dogs inside. And the Kaliak went to the edge of the lock where the stars wheeled above her and the moon was round and bright in the sky. And she waited, she waited and the animals knew that she was waiting. The birds, the nightjar, the nightingale and the owls stilled their song on the trees. The foxes quieted their breathing and the sun itself waited to move up into the sky. The Kaliak wrapped herself in a veil of silence and prepared to make her change. But there was a dog. There was a dog who I think was taken too early from his mother's body before he could brace himself against it. And because of that, he didn't know what the wild things knew. He didn't know what the birds felt and what the foxes breathed, that on the eve of Beltane all must be silent before the sunrise. The lock, the bolt was rusty and slipped open, and the dog ran down to the edge of the lock, and he knew that there were birds in the trees, and he knew that there were rabbits in the grasses, and he knew that the sun was about to rise, and so he barked. And his barking shattered the silence, and his barking reverberated from stone to stone across the lock. And at that moment, the Kaliak fell down, down into a pile of bones, and her words echoed out as well. And she said, early, too early, the dog has barked across Loch Bar. And then she was nothing but a pile of bones. The shepherd opened his eyes. He didn't know why his heart was drumming. He didn't know why he could hear the barking of dogs reverberating across the countryside. But when he looked out and saw that it was still not dawn, he pulled on his clothes and he ran down to the lock. And there he fell on his knees beside a pile of bones. It could have been roadkill. It could have been a dead sheep, but when the shepherd saw those bones, he let out a great howl of grief. And when he did so, the shepherd remembered. He remembered all of the shepherds he'd ever been. He remembered perhaps his father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, and all the shepherding that they'd done, or perhaps he remembered his wheel of lives. He remembered the sheep he tended. He remembered the earth upon which he walked. Perhaps he remembered all the way back to when he had horns upon his head. I don't know. But I know in that remembering, his eyes became like dark flame. And he looked across at his dog and he said, be still. And then he looked at the birds in the trees that were about to start singing, for they could feel that the sun was about to rise. And he said to those birds, be still. And he looked at the sun herself, ready to come out across the sky. And he said to the sun, be still. And he looked out through time, for his grief had cut a corridor through time. And he looked at the wheels that were about to start rising dust upon the roadside. And he said to them, be still. And he looked at the planes that were about to scratch the eyes out of the sky. And he said to them, be still. And in that stillness, in that veil of invoked stillness, that wrapped itself around the bones of the Kaliak. The Kaliak began to remember herself. The shepherd could not hold it for long. Soon the sun began to rise, began to lighten the sky, 
and as the sky lightened so the birds broke out. First it was the robin, then it was the sparrow, then it was the nightingale joining in the chorus, then the thrushes and the warblers, and soon the whole of the lock was alive with song that seemed to flame across the whole of the landscape. And as the song flamed like a threshold, then the sun came up through it, a great blazing ball of clarity. The shepherd covered his eyes. For it seemed he saw somebody coming out of the lock. When her feet pressed against the ground, the ground remembered the fire that had made it. When her eyes lighted against the blossoms, they opened up to the sun and to the love song of the bees and butterflies. When she opened her mouth and began to speak, it seemed as if that resonance, that vibration brought by the bee's own wings, lit upon the stamens of the plants and they released their pollen, a great cloud into the air. And all of the bugs and the bees lit upon their plants, their flowers, and sung their love song with their feet and took that pollen down down to reach the eggs inside and thus the swelling of the seeds began. I think the shepherd went home. He called his dogs. He lit a candle on his dusty altar. The Kaliak continued to dance and walk her blessings upon the landscape. Wow, so invigorating, so exquisite, and so many symbols. Can we just discuss some of them just briefly? Um, bones. Yes, bones. Um, it's so interesting because there are so many stories of the Kaliak and her bones. There's the idea of her kind of sculpting the bones of the landscape by moving the stones across the highlands, making the mountains. And there's also this amazing snippet fragment of story in which a priest comes to her house and asks her how old she is. And she tells him to go up into her loft and count the bones because every year she's been alive, she's killed a cow and she's thrown the bones of the cow up into the loft. So that's the way to find out her age. And the priest goes up and he counts the bones and in some stories he just gives up and in other stories he gets he disappears beneath the bones just a fantastic story and i know there's a really nice youtube film that laura will perhaps put in the chat for everybody to look but i just wanted to ask you actually joanna i have never heard the story that you you found and you're a little bit like Seema. you're uncovering new myths for us aren't you can you just tell us where you got that story from uh the, the the bone story or the no, not the bone story your kaliak story uh, the kaliak story so uh luckily i've got the book right here um so this is an amazing the book of the kaliak um by a, a celtic collector an academic and collector of stories and i actually came across this fragment uh on the internet and then i thought oh i need the book i need the source and actually he got it from um i think a manuscript hidden in edinburgh university um so yeah it's really exciting to kind of you know untangle and discover these these manuscripts that have been long forgotten thank you thank you um and another symbol is actually a, a, an archetype really it's the shepherd mm. isn't it and the shepherd is is ubiquitous in myths isn't he from the first recorded myth of the great goddess inanna that amy sutton shared on the second goddess out she has a lover who is the shepherd to christ and now to your shepherd but your shepherd it's a bit different. He's not the kind of dying and rising God that we're used to, not God or God man or whatever that we're used to, is he? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we were talking about the idea of the, the, the shepherd figure, um, the God shepherd uh, dying and then being uh, reborn, uh, like Adonis in, in your story, and, and of course Christ, and Demuzi who dies, Anana's shepherd. Um, and it's really, it was really, 
exciting to work with this story because it's not the shepherd masculine who dies and is reborn. It's rather him witnessing and holding space for this uh, rebirthing goddess. Um, and I think I also really like the power of the shepherd in this story because he's incredibly powerful like he stops the sun in her tracks he stops the birds and the trees but he does it as an offering it's like he's this vessel of stillness for the channel of the movement of the goddess exactly as Seema was talking about that sense of the the, the, the channels um, and so it's just a really interesting way of exploring uh, power and and kind of shifting mythic polarities of power Oh, I love that. And I love the idea that the shepherd is human, but has this power. And of course, I have to ask you about the dog. What, 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 what did you mean when you said the dog has been taken or had been taken away from his mother too soon? So that just was a detail that actually came to me when I was sort of opening up the story and thinking about it. Why does the dog, why does the dog not know, you know, when all of the wild animals have this knowing? And I guess for me, it's just the, the fact that we do take puppies away from their mums very early. And what does that do to their bodies? And, you know, that, that sense of the maternal, intuition coming physically through the body the presence of the body shared bodies and just kind of thinking that and you know also the idea of us um, as the children of the earth perhaps being divided from the earth and what we do not intentionally the dog isn't malevolent at all but that sense of you know the accidental damage that one does you know and I, I love the fact that the shepherd kind of comes in and gathers up the dog you know and, and it's like okay shh, now sometimes we need people to do that to us shh, enough oh I just have to tell you what happened to me this morning I was thinking about your story in fact I was checking my text I was walking the dog I shouldn't have been checking my text I don't normally and I saw that a film had come in and I looked at it and I got kind of enchanted and cat you know by my smartphone and my dog went after a sheep um, and in that moment, I was like, oh, no, I've lost it. I've lost my connection with everything. I, I've become, you know, a rogue dog. And I, I sort of often feel I am more dog than human, you know. <laughs> and, and I was calling, calling my, no, no lambs were killed. But I thought, you know, this rogue dog moment where we just forget our connection with nature and we go off to, after the next quick fix, you know, Seema was talking about seduction being a slow process and our connection with nature being slow. And um, we just we just run off, you know. They talk about monkey mind, aren't with me? It's the dog mind. Mm. But anyway, uh, enough of that. The staff. I want you to talk about the staff because the shepherd has a staff, doesn't he? Like Christ has the staff, leads us yes. to the sweet waters. In mythology, the shepherd has a staff, and you know we were talking that it's so interesting that the Kaliak also has the staff in the way that we typically see her portrayed. But her staff is the the iron staff of winter, with which she rules the ice and frost of the land, and it's very powerful and it's very beautiful. This image of the crone winter goddess, but it also feels almost as if there's something in me to it you know that it's not a life bringing staff and I think Seema mentioned maybe she'll, she'll talk about it later the idea that the, the staff in Tantra often represents somebody not being celibate it represents the inner consort um, but you know the Kaliak we don't see this active activating life-giving rejuvenating staff we only see this iron staff and I think it's just so um, important actually to explore stories that don't have have a split binary between youth and age but allow a constant fluid flow between them and allow this goddess to be both an old um, haggard goddess and also a rejuvenating goddess of spring because they are fluid youth and age and uh, and spring and winter also and like we were talking just before we came on are the beautiful bingo wings yes <laughs> anyway final symbol final symbol in your story the plane why did you include a plane yeah, the plane and the cars, absolutely. Again, kind of walking, walking the story, talking the story and feeling that sense of, wow, this story really has a lot to say to us today. You know, we've, we've um, experienced this stillness almost commanded upon us by this virus, by this disease. And it's also been really interesting to witness um, as we stepped back nature stepping forward and and what that means and you know talking about it as almost a holy absence that we have 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 made ourselves absent and therefore nature kind of rushes back and what that means afterwards if there is an afterwards and what that means now as we gather ourselves back into activity how we can sort of 
also be the shepherd and and, and be able to still ourselves and, and hold the holy silence to allow the rushing return of nature also. Oh, brilliant. What a great note to end this section on. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Joanna Gillard. Thank you. Thank a beautiful you. story. Uh, we're going to go now, talking of silence, to a silent movie created by the marv marvellously innovative Tanya Bat. She's just put her thing out on tectonic plates. I noticed only yesterday with children doing earthquakes. She's the author of many, many books. Um, I've just got a few of them here. And of course, she is the author of uh, The Calendar, and she's a great wit. I like this. She's got Squashy. She names that one. So there she is with some squash. Um, some of her books here, her website, Laura will put in the chat. But she's a self confessed, not just storyteller, but frockaholic, fruitaholic. And she's created this silent movie of Demeter and Persephone. Can we see it, Laura? Thank you.
Absolutely adorable, as are you, Tanya, for being up. What time is it where you are? Oh, the... it's now the grand hour of 7.33 a.m. Yeah, so you... you... In tomorrow. <laughs> 6 a.m. for your tech, wasn't it? Or quarter to six or something horrible. But just tell us what... I love that film. It's just totally batty, as you know, in, in the true bat fashion and gorgeous. Why did you choose to do that film? What was your motivation for making it with all the people there and everything? Well, the group that has started to meet monthly was in a response to your creation, um, The Goddess Lounge. Uh, we thought it would be wonderful to uh, have a group of women. And, you know, in saying this, I really feel um, the privilege that we have in Aotearoa, New Zealand, of actually being able to physically meet. We have been in a bubble of our own in the last year. Um, with not having COVID in our country. So um, to actually, as performers, when we think about it, we've spent such um, a large part of the year in isolation in terms of giving performances on screens. It was a wonderful thing just to gather a group of women together and to play in the garden. So we've done a couple of sessions in response to the various monthly um, online get togethers that you've coordinated. So um, that was part of it, um, a response to what you've created, part of it, an opportunity for women to actually get together and play together. Part of it because of um, the back to frontness of our celebrations in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, so it was Easter, it was Good Friday, and uh, here we were celebrating with all the trappings of spring, but the reality of the environment that we lived in is that it was autumn, it was the time of harvest. And of course, um, with the Christian story, very much a story of the father and son, and it seemed wonderful to celebrate the story of the mother and the daughter. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Tanya, can you talk us through a little bit, show us some images of your village, because there's... I really do think you are the one, you're such an inspiration to many people, I think, for really walking the talk when it comes to talking about ecology and looking after the environment. So, yes, over to you, and perhaps Laura can start the, the slideshow you've put together. So the Demeter and Persephone film was uh, made in my garden at the Awa Awaro Bay Eco Village on Waiheke Island in the Hauraki Gulf, which just lies off the east coast of Auckland in Aotearoa, New Zealand. About 12 years ago, I had the very clear thought that I wanted to live in relationship with 
land. My life at the time was very busy and I felt that there was a large disconnect between my values and my mahi, my work, and I wanted to see them more integrated. So an opportunity came up to become a shareholder at the Eco Village. The Eco Village had been running for 27 years. Here's a picture of what it looked like when um, it began as an Eco Village and here is a picture of it today. So it's amazing and hopeful about what actually can be achieved when humans set an intention and follow through with action. The village actually consists of 420 acres. It's a valley that runs from the Puna, the spring of an awa, all the way down to the ocean, to Awa Awarua Bay. There's about 40 to 50 adults and children who live on the land. We operate by consensus and have monthly meetings and working bees. Most of the homes are off-grid. We generate our own power through solar panels and sometimes wind turbines. We grow our own food to varying degrees, collect our own water, and in general, try to live a more simple life with the kaupapa that other life may simply live. So living in relationship with land, the land becomes the calendar, a calendar of harvests, of changing light and temperature, of animals migrating, coming and going from the environment. And instead of stories simply being told as an intellectual exercise, they are there embodied, embedded in the landscape and a part of the cycle. I love to tell the story of Athena and the creation of the olive tree each year when we do the olive harvest. And a recent story I've worked up called Mary Bumby's Hive of Story explores the sacred relationship between the human and the honeybee uh, as a result of the relationship I formed with the bees that live in my garden that I caretake. One of our tamariki instigated an eel sanctuary for our long fin tuna. Tuna is the Māori word for eel. And the sanctuary has given me an opportunity to learn and engage with a te ao Māori perspective around the story of Tunuroa, the father of all the eels. Tunuroa's um, female counterpart is um, Hina, um, who was, uh, well, my readings of it is that uh, Hina is a word for women, um, and she, she's the goddess of the wetlands, the repo. Um, and uh, it's an interesting story. I can't quite go into tell right now, but the eel is a fantastic and magnificent symbol, obviously a very phallic symbol. Um, but I go down and sing to the eels. They are very responsive to sound and you can call them up and we hand feed them. So they're very wonderful animals. Tunuroa was the inspiration behind a children's album of stories that merge science, spirituality and storytelling to explore natural life cycles called Dance Upon Our Earth. So more and more uh, my values and the experience of living on the land has integrated into my actual mahi as a storyteller and arts educator, whether it be in my own uh, personal expressions of artwork or through inviting teachers into my environment to look at ways we can teach through our environment or community events. I recently ran our Santa Parade as a fossil fuel free fiesta. While Santa's uh, credibility might be under question, uh, the reality of climate change certainly isn't. There's so much to share, but this is a particular favorite project of mine, which involved growing hue, which were one of the first uh, five plants that uh, Māori brought with them down through the South Pacific. Uh, I grew the gourds, or calabashes as some people might know them as, and then painted them to explore the shared relationship as humans we have around growing food and what that looked like in Aotearoa, New Zealand, when Māori and Pākehā first met in the garden. So that is a little bit about uh, me and my garden and the land that is the source of inspiration for my mahi.
Oh, thank you so much, Tani. There's a tremendous amount of work gone into um, the Demeter and Persephone movie and, um, and yeah, fantastic presentation. But I think, well, let's bring all the artists on now. Um, and I loved what you were, you were talking about there, Tanya, when you said you were singing to the eels and this theme, as you say, of sound and uh, silence is so important. And if we can get Seema there, I just want, I know you've got something very interesting to talk to us and we'll go back to Tanya in a second about bees. Yeah, so actually this whole idea of the silence and the sound and so on, um, I just want to say that actually one of the festivals, um, which I just discovered this morning, um, which is done, you know, one of the love festivals, it's actually called the Festival of Silence. So there is one particular day when there is no laughter, there is this whole idea of channeling the energy through silence as well, so which is very exciting. But yes, so I recently interviewed this lady called Lily Hunter Green, who started life as a classically trained pianist, became a beekeeper, and she keeps bees in her old pianos. And she was telling me how her bees, she can tell what mood they're in, depending on what, what note they're humming at. And her bees, when they're happy, they hum in collective A. And then, I mean, and we talked about sort of all the different notes they hit, but it got even more exciting because she said to me that when the queen bees are born, because there's the, the worker bees will produce a whole bunch of queen bees for the hive, because it's not just the one, they have to see which one's going to be the best, you know, who's going to be most able to produce better bees and look after the hive. And so they produce a whole bunch of bees, queen bees. And the queen bees have this battle and it's almost like, um, you know, like Game of Thrones, they, they kind of announce their arrival out of their cells. So they break the cells, they announce it, and there's this hum and the buzz, and it's like a song. And she actually translated it into music and had opera singers sing it, because it really was like the call of the Valkyries. You know, it was like they, they, they sting each other to death till one dies and the other one survives, but it's the song that goes with it. And Seema, tell us something about, you know, bees and the Kama Sutra and the sounds you make love making. Okay, so yes, of course. So um, Kamdev, the god of love and desire, who is now no more, but his, um, his um, bow is, the, the, the string of the bow is made of a string of bees. And every time he pulls it, we talk about the twang of that particular string. And it's the hum, the note of that twang that's really, really important. So I guess, again, it depends on, because there are five different types of arrows that he shoots. And these arrows of Kamdev, you know, Cupid is a sweet, -sy, cutesy little guy. Kamdev is not quite so cutesy, sweetsy. In the Indian context, love is not so cutesy. It, it's more to it, you know. So the five arrows that he shoots, one will completely, I mean, it'll, it'll make you hallucinate. Another one will make you go delirious. Another one will make you completely blind to what's happening and, and, and so on. So, I mean, they're very powerful arrows. And I guess it depends on which arrow he's going to shoot. The twang of the bees matches the sound of what that's going to do to your brain. And of course, there is um, the first thing that I discovered about bees when I was studying the Kama Sutra was that you know, we have this thing about what sounds you make uh, during lovemaking to show what level of um, arousal you're at. So as the man, if you were with your partner, who's, uh, you know, the, the female would make the sounds, the woman would make these sounds. And if she was making certain types of sounds, you knew that you were doing the right thing because it was kind of going according to the right notes. It was, you know, you were like cooing like a pigeon or sounding like a hoopoo or, you know, whatever. And there is one thing where it says that, okay, if she's not doing any of them, but if she's making this little subaltern buzzing, humming sound like the bees, then you know you're hitting the spot. <laughs> Fantastic. Just briefly, um, Tanya, you keep bees. Have you noticed any sounds? Song? Yes. It's a wonderful thing to go out to um, your hive and to press your ear up against it and hear the hum of the hive. And they do make different sounds. Um, anyone who's gone into a hive will um, uh, assure you that once you actually enter the hive and you start to interfere with bees, their song changes quite considerably. 
But going back to that point about bees being very knowing creatures, um, and I see somebody was talking about that in the chat there, and um, your piece, Joanna, about the, the young dog who didn't know his knowing was robbed of him by take, being taken away from that maternal connection. For me, um, in that piece around bees, that was kind of at the core of the exp exploration is the idea that we do actually have this deep knowing and how to reconnect with what it is that we know and what are the processes that disconnect us from from that knowing hmm. so interesting isn't it yeah so. uh, i have to make may, may i just jump in and say you know this idea of putting your ear to the hive i mean that just the thought of it frightens the hell out of me that you'd actually want to put your ear to a hive full of bees but it kind of takes me back to the point that I, apparently, um, uh, Cleopatra used to use this as a pleasure instrument, as a sort of dildo of sorts. So she had this egg, wooden egg that was made, and it would be filled with really angry bees, and she would use that as a dildo. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Taking animal exploitation to a whole nother level. Yeah. <laughs> But let's just let's just uh, go over to Joanna to just close before we get the audience in. Joanna, we've sort of been talking about sound, very excitable sound. Let's give you the last word on silence. The last word on silence. Well, I'm really interested by what Tanya was saying about how we make that reconnection, you know, how we allow that. Because it's not that we don't know, is it? It's just that we have to have to have the veil of silence to allow the voices of intuition to come back up because we're so used to thinking, aren't we? And I think that, you know, as Seema was saying about the stories that creep through, it's also that the stories can creep through to us, um, into our intuition and into our heart and into our gut. So I think it's the, it's the dance of stories and silence that we need to have alongside the intellect and the thinking that will allow kind of the other voices to rise and then that we will be like like everybody responding to Aphrodite in your stories Anthony and that we will throw the seeds everywhere and do the dance and the climate data and, and, and we will save the world. Thanks so much Joanna. <laughs> now Umi you've really walked right into it there because Umi has called me a spoil sport for cutting uh, uh, Seema on the dildo of bees. So now we're going to get all the audience in and um, any questions that you've got, please put your cameras on. If you've got any questions or thoughts or buzzing to do, please, Laura, can you bring the audience in and we'll just spend five, six minutes um, talking to the audience, getting more out of whoever you want to get more out of. But thank you so much, everybody, uh, all the artists for coming. Thank you so much, Tanya, for being here very, very early. And oh, there's, there's Amy. Come on, Umi, show yourself. <laughs> hi there, hi there. Yes, right. Let's just to know, to let everyone know, if they're not following the chat, if you want to join us, just raise your hand, because I don't want to bring anyone through without their consent. Oh. Sorry, um, Umi was calling Fiona a spoil sport. I'm so sorry about that, Umi. <laughs> I thought you were dying for some more love bites from Seema. <laughs> Hi, Fiona. I think Fiona's I'm, I'm hoping to hear a demonstration from Dr. Seema of some of the sounds because I might not be getting it right. <laughs> I think we're going to have to do this one another time. I, I have to learn this one from Tanya to just get the right notes that the, the birds make because they're a series of bird sounds that you're supposed to make. But um, yeah, actually, it would be perfect. Tanya, the garden porn star. That's your next thing, you know, the, um, <laughs> the sounds of the bird sounds. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Maybe we should make a scratch and sniff calendar. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Fiona, there was no Balbo in that particular Demeter and Persephone um, uh, retelling. Um, that's a, a fabulous little detail. And I was just, I did toy with the idea and then um, it became what it was, really. Um, I, I, it, it was a wonderful film. It was a wonderful film. But, <laughs> but that is my favourite bit of the story. Yes, something like a little bit of genital exposure. Oh, yeah. Like always, the... bring, always brings a smile. That's right. <laughs> oh. so I actually find that, you know, in the goddess stories, since everybody's coming on now, it's so lovely to see everybody's faces. I just find that, you know, we, um, at least 
in India, where I'm, uh, where I'm from, that part of the world, a lot of these stories have been changed. And they're told from a different gaze. They're told from a very male gaze. And it's just about trying to go back into telling them from a different perspective, just so that you're actually telling it from the woman's point of view. And I think for me, that's been so special about these stories because um, I mean, I do deal with the erotic tales. So for me, you know, that's where I'm focusing on. But it's it's just so special, some of those um, stories, because we have one tale where um, the, the and it's a, it's a strange kind of story. But we have this one story from our ancient past where there is the king is dead and he has he's left two wives behind there are no children and at one stage the two women go they, they say that when you have your periods after that you have your very special ceremonial bath and they come out of that and they look at each other and they fall in love with each other I and mean, they're just overcome with lust for each other and they want to make love and so they actually wander around they find their dead husband's bed you know i mean they're trying to see where they can be and we're told that from this love making a child is born because in ancient um, in the belief that they, they said that when a child is born from the husband, from the man, from the father comes all the hard stuff, the bones and so on. And from the um, mother comes all the soft stuff, the organs and so on. So the child is born, but without bones. So he kind of limps and is a cripple. But I just love the idea that this, this leads that their lovemaking, it's not hidden. It actually leads to a child being born. And then this child is made okay in the end and goes on to do great things. But it's the telling of this story that it just kind of raises so much hope in me. Because in this story, at one point, one of the queens wants to kill herself. She says, oh my God, I'm a widow. And I've done this. And what will people say? And the gods come down and say, no, it's okay. We'll take the sin on ourselves. You know, you go ahead and do it. So there were stories that were told from the woman's point of view, um, where she's not lamenting, where things are good, you know, the, the thing is done. It's, it's not a victim tale, mm. uh, but we, we've kind of silenced those stories. So I guess Joanna's silence works in so many different ways. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm just thinking about how then how we do regain the women's story or, you know, what we do with the stories to allow different different dialogues to come through. You know, and it's 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 like we were talking about at the at the gender bending goddess lounge, you know, how you allow the queer stories to come through or the, or, or the other stories that have been forgotten. And it is it's sitting with the stories, both in silence and also in community, isn't it? And that, that's what Xantha, you've kind of been holding as all through this goddess land it's the idea of community that allows stories to forgotten stories to come through anybody like to make any other questions points come in no well just fantastic thank you so much everybody thank you for coming thank you for contributing thank you for putting your cameras on and being here and please do come to the next goddess lounge we've got joe blake and of course the wonderful laura coppin who is going to be sharing her passion for insects which you might have seen in joanna's film there because she got the the, the insect footage together and she's going to be what is it, Laura, you're going to be doing? You're going to be in intersecting with insects. Yes, very much. Intersecting with insects um, and exploring locust sentient, making a locust costume and yes. dowing with the oud. Mm. Wonderful. And we've got the, the marvellous uh, uh, vocal explosion singer, Juliet Russell, and what, uh, Katrina Faber, whose festival Singing Our Place was the inspiration for this whole grant application, um, along with all the, the, the fabulous, however many goddesses we've got coming up every every month. So thank, thank thanks again, everybody. And wow, I'm sorry to say goodbye. I've been so looking forward to seeing everybody and now you're all here and now you're all gonna go. Lots of love to you. Stay well and enjoy coming out of lockdown as we do. And thank you, everybody.